we're going to have a chat today about um, mapping and identifying areas in your in your school grounds or green spaces that might be good for outdoor learning and having a think about wildlife habitats in those school grounds. And what we'd like to do is suggest some easy and low cost ways that you can you and your children that you're working with actually can help improve those grounds for wildlife, because ultimately the richer the grounds are in, uh, for wildlife, the, the richer the learning opportunities are going to be. Um, and we're going to talk to you a little bit about how to assess and um, minimise impact that any outdoor learning activities might have on wildlife and, and natural spaces in your school grounds. Uh, as I said at the start, some of you might not be here when I said, my name is Dawn O'Malley. Um, I am Training Officer for Hampshire Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust. Um, lots of forest school, lots of outdoor learning training we deliver. I also deliver some wild beach training. Um, so really, um, uh, really love my job. I'm very lucky um, to, to work in this sector and, and um, really privileged to um, help spread the word at different schools and settings. So I think that's one of the key parts of our wilder strategy really is empowering and sharing knowledge and, and experience with um, as many people as possible to um, make more and more wilder spaces um, and, off and offer um, access to those spaces for our young people. So I just wanted to quickly go over what our, um, our team wilder strategy means. Um, so the Wildlife Trust, essentially what we want is um, more spaces that are bigger or better, that are more connected. So wildlife is able to move around between these wild spaces. Um, the graphic here shows you the kind of thing we're talking about. So the more, um, we, we need more nature reserves in the first place, but we also need these kind of corridors joining our nature reserves. And these might be green spaces, they might be people's back gardens, they might be privately la owned land, they might be school grounds or setting grounds. Um, but the more of these stepping stones and linking um, green spaces we have between our nature reserves, the easier it is for wildlife to, to spread and, and flourish. Um, so we put this graphic as well together about kind of connecting up our network of green, green and, and, and nature friendly spaces. Um, and it's really important because biodiversity is um, the variety of all life on Earth. And it's really important to, to improve biodiversity. Um, it's essential for sustaining living networks and systems. And actually, we all need um, a, a stable nature recovery network for our own health and wealth. Things like food, fuel, all our vital services, everything our lives depend on, depend on uh, a functioning nature, uh, nature network. Um, and unfortunately, our nature reserves are becoming a very mu much a last refuge for rare and endangered wildlife, which is why we need more of these sort of stepping stones um, that are just improved spaces, improved for wildlife, might not specialise in anything in particular. Um, but um, they're still really, really valuable and important and even if you might look around your school grounds and think, well, there's not much here, it doesn't offer a lot, um, you'd be surprised um, how much wildlife it actually does sustain um, and how, how, how important it is in this kind of bigger picture network. So why is it important? Um, this graphic shows some of the declines that we've seen and there's lots and lots coming out, particularly with COP26, I'm sure you can find loads of references and resources showing you the evidence really, the, 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 the problems we have with the twin crisis of climate change and nature um, um, and the nature crisis. So we've got some, some graphics here, there's some of the data here showing how um, different species have, um, diff we, we're seeing this decline over the last few decades. Um, and this is just local local data and we've got a global picture coming out in a lot of the kind of IPCC reports and things that are out at the moment. Um, and some of the mental health data that's coming out kind of alongside this is also giving us good cause and reason for making change. So urban green spaces provide um, loads of possibilities for both physical and mental health benefits um, through contact and time in nature. And uh, some areas we're seeing some pioneering health policies come forwards, recognise the importance of these spaces. And I think with our kind of looming mental health crises with our young people, our school grounds can also offer some of these kind of respite and mental health natural services, if you will, 
um, to support our people, our, our young people. And everyday experiences really do matter for our well-being. Um, I, I, I really love um, the work by um, Derby University. Um, there's a professor there who's been pushing forwards um, ideas and, and theories around um, natural um, health benefits of being in time with, out in time in nature. Um, Professor Miles Richardson, if you wanted to, to look up his work around nature connection, it's really, um, I think, really inspiring stuff there. Um, and really, I think for our, our, particularly our primary school age and our early years children, um, being out in our green spaces gives them time to notice some of the really small things in nature. Um, and the more time we're able to give them out in these spaces, the, the more important these, um, these local flora and fauna will be to them. And that develops connection over time. So I'm just adding some more people from the waiting room at the same time. Um, and unfortunately we are seeing species declines and some of our kind of our, our, um, our classic British wildlife that we would say is kind of, um, you know, key in some of our areas, things like hedgehogs from our urban spaces and are, are disappearing we're losing iconic species iconic bird species are just not returning like cuckoos every year um, so even in our in our lifetimes we're seeing these declines in these kind of iconic and, and well-known species um, and and these are the famous the headline stories there's a lot of other species that may not even have a uh, a, a common name that we're losing a lot of our invertebrates and pollinators, for example, um, we're losing and they're becoming extinct. And we don't even know that we don't even recognize often that, that that's happening because they're not as iconic as some of these other species. But these, it's like a the tip of the iceberg we're seeing. Oops. Ah, so here's a slide about um, the nature connection theory that I just mentioned by Miles Richardson. So He's proposed five pathways um, that people um, uh, develop um, deep nature connection through. And it might be that um, for our young people, a way to help help our children develop a deeper nature connection might be through thinking about how we can weave these pathways into our delivery and our outdoor spaces to help them connect with nature. Um, I won't go too much into this because there's going to be another whole webinar in um in the new year that my um manager becky will be delivering which will be focusing a lot on well-being and thinking about nature connection um, i just wanted to post this here if you wanted to look it up a bit more um, after this so what can we do to benefit wildlife in our school grounds or our early years and settings grounds um, there's three key basics really we can provide essentials of food shelter and nest space and water. And what I'd like to do is just show you some pictures and slides and ideas um, around these kind of three key things that we can offer, even in the smallest of spaces. So let's start with food. Um, I know it seems quite obvious, but we can provide food for wildlife through artificial feeders, um, but uh, things like bird feeders, butterfly feeders, etc. Um, but we can also provide some more kind of natural um, sources, having more nectar and pollen available, seed heads at the end of the summer. You know, so if we're trying not to be too tidy with our type, with our gardening, keeping seed heads um, and, and um, empty stems and things like that will be great for, for wildlife at the end of the year. Um, and also by um, providing habitats for our invertebrates, we're also then hopefully increasing our invertebrate numbers, which then is a food source for, for other species that rely on those. So birds, for example, small mammals, etc. Shelter and nest. Um, so uh, we can um, think about when we're looking at our school grounds and our spaces, um, where would be good places to um, to enable creatures to, to shelter over winter, for example, or to nest in those nesting seasons. 
we can build things like mini beast hotels and there's um, loads of examples if you google um, mini beast hotels or if you're on social media uh, um, you can find loads and loads of inspiring pictures and, and different approaches that people have made to creating mini beast hotels it's a really nice activity to do with a group so if you work with if you have an eco gardening group for example or after school clubs this is a nice ongoing project to stock and, and maintain these kind of artificial little homes for, for invertebrates. We can also think about how we look after the rest of the grounds to make more space for shelter and nests. So if you have hedges, and often a lot of schools do have hedgerows, um, we can think about um, thickening, thickening those up. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, hedge laying in a minute. So we can make them better uh, and, and more, more sheltering um, for birds, for nesting and, and our small mammals. Um, you may have mature trees on your site and we could think about um, bat boxes, bird boxes, etc., that might be appropriate on those trees to provide more um, nesting spaces. If you're lucky enough to have any dead wood on site, again, this is great for invertebrates. Um, a lot of beetle larvae, for example, will burrow into um, dead wood uh, and live in within live and eat within the dead wood for many years. Um, stag beetles is one that just pops to mind. So um, maintaining dead wood on site is, is really important for improving biodiversity. Um, standing dead wood, again, if it's not in a dangerous situation, so it's not somewhere where you muster or cluster with groups, and standing dead wood, again, opens up doors to lots of other um, species, um, providing them with the, that kind of niche habitat that they need. Um, and I've already mentioned some examples of artificial boxes, but other things that you might want to think about and other projects that might be fun to make with your groups are things like hedgehog homes, toad abodes, frog attacks I've seen as well, loads of stuff, you name it. I'm sure we could build some kind of artificial home for it. Um, and again, if you look online, you'll find different instructions for making these types of things. Our Wildlife Watch website, which I'm going to mention a few times during this presentation, has some really nice downloadable guide sheets. Um, there's a lovely one on how to make a hedgehog box with measurements and things like that. Bird boxes, again, the, the, the ratio for cutting your wood so that you've got the right, so you can make little stacks, little packs for, um, with all the pieces you need to then build a bird box. Um, and it's a great activity. I've done it a lot with um, after school clubs and youth groups and things. It works really well as a kind of a lead activity. Um, key thing to remember about bird boxes in particular, though, is that they will need um, somebody to be keeping an eye over the winter and emptying them out of bird nesting season so that they're um, cleaned and ready for the next year so that we reduce kind of parasites and things like that. So um, just one little kind of um, thing to add to your um, your management uh, rotor, thinking about your sites. If you've got a lot of bird boxes, you might have to think of a have plan a day a year in the winter where you go around and empty those ready for the next year. So let's think about water next. Um, some schools are lucky enough to have um, ponds already in place. Some may not. Um, it's a bit of a, a kind of a bit controversial whether actually a pond is the most appropriate thing to have in a school ground or whether actually um, there would be equally as many learning opportunities for the children and also benefits to wildlife if you just had a wet area or a boggy area. So um, I, I have advised occasions. It does depend very much on the school itself and the situation and location of the pond um, but sometimes if you've got a pond that just keeps draining away you've got a holy liner for example and it's going to cost a lot of time and money to fix then actually that space could be transformed into a bog, boggy area with bog plants um, and it would be just as beneficial for wildlife be less maintaining and you could also do some of those curriculum led activities um, looking at um, the, the the species present sampling um, and, and, and all of those kind of fun things that we can go out and do with our groups. So depending on very much on your school and site, um, uh, providing water either as a pond or a boggy area or having things like bird bars, uh, um, even small sunken ponds. I've seen lots of examples of um, washing up bowls that have been dug down into the ground to make a really small little pond. 
Um, and I, I think I've got a picture coming up, actually a little diagram showing how to build those. So it doesn't even have to be a, a particularly large pond. Any water that you're able to have on site um, will have huge biodiversity um, benefits um, providing that water source. So even small um, is a really good thing. It's better than no water at all. Obviously, there are some um, health and safety considerations around having a pond on site. You'll need to have it securely fenced off and accessible with only um, with, with supervising adults only um, so that you're complying with those health and safety requirements and, and Ofsted. Um, so that needs to be thought about. Um, ponds themselves also do have um, ongoing maintenance that is needed. Um, we normally recommend that over the winter, um, plant material is removed, particularly if you've got trees that are dropping leaf litter into the ponds, that will build up and, and change the chemistry of the water and, and you may end up with algal blooms and things through that influx of nutrients. So it's a good idea to um, have a clear out, um, particularly if it's getting overrun with lilies, for example, you can take, you can just rip those in half and if someone else has a pond they want to put them in, they can, but um, cut, keeping, keeping um, the vegetation down over winter um, provides a kind of a boost the next year and, and reduces those nutrients so that you don't get those algal blooms happening. Um, you also might need to um, think about the type of liner. Liners tend to degrade over time. Um, so you might have a, a kind of a cost implication at some point where you might have to completely take it up and, and fix it. Um, so there's a few few things to consider with that. But as I said, if that is an issue for your school, if you know that your pond possibly has a, a leak, if it, if it dries out regularly over the summer months, um, it may be that actually it would be more cost effective to turn it into a kind of a bog, boggy space. So I'm going to just zoom back now to thinking about um, what to do when when you um, are tasked with overhauling your school grounds or making them more user friendly, more able to deliver outdoor learning, those kind of initial planning stages, you might um, have thought through those three things of nest and shelter, of food and of water and think, right, I want to get those things in place on my school grounds. But before you do start making big changes, we always recommend going through this, this kind of um, mapping stage. So think about the space you already have. Try to involve the pupils as much as possible. Give them a voice in making decisions. Um, they could do the mapping for you, for example, we'll actually go out and walk around the site, map it out. Think about um, what spaces you have. Are there sunny spaces, shady spaces, slopey spaces, boggy spaces, wet spaces already that flood that might then actually be a really good space to put a pond. Um, what's your soil type? They can go and test the soil type, pH um, strips and all that. Um, have a think about whether it's acidic, alkaline soil you're working with, if it's chalky. Um, and then put all of this information together. Um, so you've got all of these kind of factors um, all together on one map. And then that will help you with that next point of, of designating habitats to those spaces. So actually this space would be excellent for our, our bog garden. This space is a really sunny aspect. This would be great if we wanted to have an allotment or if we wanted to have a butterfly garden with herb planters. If we wanted to have a forest school space, um, this area under the trees and, and with these hedgerows actually provides some of the play opportunities that we want at forest school so, uh, and resources that we would like at forest school. So this space would work for that type of activity. Um, start planning it all out, measure it all out. Um, and then you have a, a good initial um, survey map. Um, it would also be good at this point to start thinking about constraints um, with making any changes in your grounds. Um, you might want to think about um, some of the practicalities, like are there any underground cables going through your, your space? Are there overhead lines? Are there drains? Um, is there kind of um, ownership changes, land ownership changes on your space? Um, are there boundaries that need marking onto this map? Um, think about all of those, get those things marked onto these maps. Um, 
And remember, you're not trying to create classrooms as such. Um, we still are looking for that kind of wild, wild resource rich and opportunity rich space. So you don't want to get too narrowly focused into creating just an outdoor classroom in one space of the grounds. We are trying to think holistically and keep it flexible, um, having spaces that can do different types of things. So you're not just able to do one type of activity in one space. Try and think kind of holistically whilst you're mapping is a really good idea. And also think about the seasons. I already mentioned about if you know that there's a boggy space of the grounds, um, think about what the different spaces are like in the winter. What are they like in the summer? Is it a really, really empty, um, are you looking at a space where there's there's no shade at all and it's just kind of open to the elements? Maybe that's not the best space to, to plan to have um, certain outdoor learning activities because you might need to think about having shade for the children or having access to the toilets. Um, and we also, as the Wildlife Trust, we also all, always advise in this kind of planning stage, think about um surveying species that are already present so think about what wildlife you already have on your site what can you do to improve access for them um, is there anything on your site or using your site that's protected um, we have um, lots of protected species we've also got invasive species that you might need to think about um, planning in removal or restriction so think about Kind of what wildlife is already there you could always go out and survey that with the children themselves um, lots of um, great learning there cross-curricular learning you can do surveying um, mapping out um, and manipulating that data back in the classroom it's always a good idea when you're doing species surveys to do them at different stages of the year as well because you'll see different things at different times of the year so you might get spring bulbs coming up in that spring term for example that you wouldn't see if you went and surveyed now um, and vice versa, you might have um, great wildflower meadow plants growing in your school field that you wouldn't necessarily know about at this time of year either. Um, and just another slide on some other ways that you can map your site. Um, I really like the idea of going out. I've not actually ever done this, but I've learned this from um, um, some colleagues of mine at Learning Through Landscapes, um, they did some great work um, sound mapping school grounds and measuring decibel levels at different times of the day. And actually that's really helpful, I feel, for then planning out where would make a good um, log circle. Um, you don't really want that in the really noisy spaces of the school grounds. Um, if you wanted to have a well-being garden, for example, again, you need to think about those sound levels at different times of the day and whether that would work with those plans that you have for that space. Um, and another one that um, I really like the idea of is emotional mapping. So this is where children will um, go round the grounds and um, in different spaces they will um, uh, label their own emotions when they're in that space. Um, so for example you might have a colour code system where um, if they're in a space where they feel protected and safe, secure, welcome, happy, um, you might colour code that green. If they feel a little bit on alert or a little bit unwelcome, they might colour code that as amber. Or if they feel like they don't belong or it's unsafe, then they can label that as red. And that helps as well. I think that really helps with the bigger picture of thinking about, okay, if we, if we have a limited budget and a limited amount we can do, maybe identifying and addressing those red zones and making them welcoming, making them accessible, making them feel more, um, more wild or more fun. Maybe those should be those priority spaces. And similarly with access and inclusion, again, if you have a limited budget, actually maybe focusing the, your work and attention on those spaces that are not accessible so that all children have um, access to, to outdoor learning maybe prioritising putting in ramps if you need to, making, making pathways more accessible, um, maybe providing outdoor kits, um, having waterproofs and wellies available for all, maybe that's the better spend of your money um, to be able to access those spaces. I just wanted to carry on that theme actually of equality and diversity and inclusion. So 
I've got some statistics here from the monitor of engagement with the natural environment um, series of surveys that have been going on over the past few years. Um, and they don't make happy reading. Um, and actually, I think this is a call to arms, um, particularly for those working in our schools that have um, deprived wards that they're serving. Um, actually, there is a, a real great need to be able to offer all children attending our schools opportunity to access green space. I think that the statistic of, of one in five people lacking access to green space from public to gar and, and gardens is just really shocking. Um, so if we're able to provide this access in our school grounds and make our school grounds richer, um, then hopefully we're working in the right direction to, to offer children meaningful contact and connection with nature. Okay, so how can we improve our spaces for outdoor learning? So once you've done your mapping, your surveying, you've thought about what there is, um, we want to make sure we're involving everybody. So um, involving our, our wider school community at this stage. Um, so you've done some of your initial planning, bringing in that wider community at this planning stage would be really helpful. Think about what connects around your school grounds are you right next to, say, um, a churchyard that have wild areas within them? Are you near a local green space? It uh, might be a local authority area, for example, or you might be near the coast or, uh, or, or anything like that. Any, any kind of farmland nearby, for example. Think about what you have around you uh, and start kind of connecting and, and thinking about that nature network. Um, what what wildlife might be using those other spaces nearby the school how can we improve connectivity or enhance the good things that are already around our school so bringing in um, that wider school community would be really helpful at this stage and you never know what might come with that involving of of, of other uh, members of your community it might bring funding for example it might bring skills and expertise um, it might bring in volunteers parents for example um, you never, unless you ask, you never know what might come for, from from it. So it's worth connecting, making those making those connections. You're also going to need to think about um, impact assessments of outdoor learning. So what kind of outdoor learning do we want to do? Do we want to make sure children are um, benefiting from from wild play? Um, do we want to provide relaxation and um, and 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 those kind of therapeutic services that, that nature can bring? Do we want to meet curriculum aims uh, and um, do some practical work outside um, in our grounds? All of these different types of outdoor learning um, and outdoor provision will have different impacts. So we need to think about what those impacts will be on the space and on nature and come up with a balance. OK, so we might need to put some balances in, in process. I'm going to talk about this a bit more on a future slide. Um, but also we want to start celebrating successes because that's the best way to drive forwards any improvements and change. So celebrate any small successes you have along the way at this point as well. So don't just wait until a space has been created and finished. If there's anything that comes up that's worth celebrating, perhaps a new species gets discovered by a pupil during one of the surveys, celebrate it. If um, a new um, piece of equipment is donated, celebrate it so make sure we're, we're building in success celebrations along the way because that really does help with with that kind of um pushing forwards of, of the agenda just having a quick i think i've missed something from my notes there but never mind right so a bit more on surveying um there are loads of curriculum links that you can find for involving children in surveying work. And it's really great. This is a really great um, introduction to, for children to ecology and nature um, and potential careers in these in these sectors. So a really great thing to be able to offer in your school grounds. There are loads of wildlife charities um, that you can get in touch with to um, ask for advice and support. Um, a few examples I just wanted to share. Um, there's a brilliant project called Snakes in the Heather by the Amphibian and Reptile Conservation Trust. They have an education officer there who is happy to come out uh, and deliver school 
activities. Um, they're also happy to do training. They've got those of resources and things that they can share around amphibians and reptiles. And that's a great charity to get, um, particularly if your um, school is located um, near, our, near some of our national parks, for example, that have um, really great reptiles, um, then that's definitely a charity I'd um, get, in, get in touch with. But also you can speak to us as the Hampshire Island White Wildlife Trust about other um, ecology um, training that we might be able to offer you if you wanted to learn a bit more about longworth traps, for example, trapping small mammals. Um, if you wanted to learn a bit more about pond dipping, we occasionally do pond dipping courses and things like that to help um, educators and teachers feel a bit more confident in those um, basic ID skills. So do get in touch with your local wildlife charities. Um, and also it's great fun. It's really, really fun. Um, all of these things will um, definitely add to, and, and can you can find loads of cross curriculum links to tick off loads and loads of great learning through all of these things. Um, so really do get involved and, and have a go. Um, well, I've written a big note in capital letters here to just remind everybody, if you are gonna do um, big changes to your grounds, I would definitely advise doing a nice um, broad baseline survey of what's on your site before you make those changes, because then you can celebrate um, year on year how more biodiverse your site is getting. So if you have a good baseline survey first, that's really important to then demonstrate the impact of any change. So next slide, this one is looking again at um, um, measuring impact of our activities that we might be doing in our school grounds or our setting grounds. Um, it's a bit like a risk assessment process. Um, so the way we um, advise you do this is you think about, think about what those activities are that you would like to do in your school grounds. You might have a particular focus and you know that you're going to be running forest school and you know what types of activities happen at forest school. Or it might be that your focus is going to be on wildlife gardening, eco gardening, and you know what kinds of things happen during those sessions. So think about particularly um, ones that will um, be regularly repeated. So I've got an example on here of bug hunting. We do a lot of that at Forest School. Um, and then we break it down into how that impacts the different um, layers of our, this, I've set this one out as a woodland, but you could change the columns um, to the different parts of your school ground. So we think about the impact it might have on the soil. We might think about the impact it has on um, the, um, uh, the, the, the plants in that shrub layer, and then our canopy layer, which is our slightly larger trees, um, all the way up through those different layers. We might think about any impacts it might have on any water sources at our school, if we've got any drainage or ditches, any rivers, that kind of thing, what impacts um, that activity will have on those different things. Nesting birds is another thing that we think about. How, how is there an impact of that activity on, on protected birds? Um, and then we end up with this kind of filled out table that shows where those high impacts might be and then where we have those high impacts. So, for example, for bug hunting, it's got obviously quite a high impact on our invertebrates because um, they might be displaced. They might get a bit squished um, through the learning. Um, so we might then think about how we can mitigate that high impact. And um, a typical one that we might do for bug hunting is that we have honey potted the space that we do that activity in. So we just have a set number of logs um, that are the ones that tend to get turned over for, for hunting for bugs. And we teach the children how to respect the creatures through our teaching. Um, we teach them to put the logs back, for example, to provide um, the shelter after they finish the activity. And we would do that for our different learning activities in our school grounds and, and mitigating for those, those impacts. If you're not sure about impact assessment, again, you can get in touch with us at the Wildlife Trust and we'd be more than happy to give you a bit of a helping hand on this. Um, uh, we can um, come out and do school visits as well. So we're more than happy to come out and give you some advice. Um, so do get in touch if you're a bit unsure about impact assessment. Um, I think, again, this would be a really nice activity to do if you've got an eco group, for example. Um, this, is, this would be something I would involve those children in. They can think about what the school community do in their grounds. 
um, and what impacts those things might have on, on nature and their spaces. Oh, this might be a bit of what I've already just said. Um, yeah, so some, some other solutions. So I gave you the example of bug hunting. Some other things that um, activities you might do that might have impact might be if you have campfires regularly, um, if you do a lot of nature, a um, lot of activities where you're collecting natural materials or even coppicing materials from site. Um, these activities might over time cause um, problems such as denudation, which is when you start losing those loose parts, so you run out of sticks on your site, that's quite common in school grounds. Um, compaction of the ground if you've got heavily used spaces, um, which can then lead to a bit of flooding because you've because uh, the children have been tramp trampling a particular space a lot, taking all the air out of the soil and then it's um, water when it rains won't soak in. So, so some of the solutions to some of these issues might be that um, areas get rested, you might cordon off spaces and use other spaces on your site um, to give them time to rest. You might have, um, like I say, designated spaces for things. So there might be one area where campfires happen. You might have a raised campfire on a bowl so that it's not directly onto the ground. Um, you might have a kind of semi-permanent um, mud play station so that mud play only happens next to that mud kitchen, for example. Um, and, and also maybe having mitigation spaces. So having um, spaces that are for wildlife and not for learning on your site might again be a good, a good impact um, mitigation. So back to ponds again. Um, some of the history of, of why ponds are important to put in place. Um, we have actually lost um, over 50% of our ponds over the 20th century, um, either through kind of industrialization, getting filled in um, and other, other issues. Um, it does mean that um, we've got a lot less ponds than we used to. And when we consider that ponds support two thirds of our freshwater species, um, I would definitely argue that if you're gonna make one change for wildlife in your grounds, then actually putting in place a wildlife pond um, would be the, the most beneficial for wildlife. Um, I'm going to ask you, let's, let's have a quick chat. Who would like to share what they think makes a good wildlife pond? If you want to put your mic on and just sort of shout out what you feel would make a good wildlife pond. I'm open. Variety of oxygenating plants. Super. A plain water area. Sorry, say that again. Rainwater. Yes, perfect. You're using rainwater rather than tap water. A beach area so that um, animals can get out of the water. Perfect, yeah. Good access, having those shallow spaces with sometimes beach, sometimes I've seen them with ramps as well. Logs around, dead wood, all this kind of stuff. Lovely, yeah. Having some other shelter nearby. Um, our amphibians and things will really love overwintering under dead, dead logs and things by your pond. Um, mixture of sort of um, sunlight and shade. Yes, good stuff. Yeah, um, so sighting your pond is really important. Having, having that mix so that it's not just in full sun um, because that you're, you are likely possibly in, on really hot summers to, to dry out. So having a nice mix of shade and sun but I would definitely say don't go all shade because that's a bit of a disaster. <laughs> the quieter area of the school so that um, the noise of the children doesn't put the animals off from making homes. Perfect, yeah, that sounds good. A bit of peace. Anything else? Or we, that's quite a good list. Plants to cover some of the surface. Yeah, the planting. The planting is really important. I'll just go on to my next slide and then I'll come back to the planting. So, yeah, I think you covered most of my list here. Um, so having kind of access, um, having um, a good location in terms of that sunlight and shady areas, 
Um, I talked a bit about size. Um, it can be small or it can be big, so that doesn't really matter as long as there's a pond, I'd say. Um, and adjacent habitat. So um, Oksana mentioned there about having dead wood nearby, logs and things to have shelter nearby your pond. Um, it might be nice to have um, a mix of, of, of habitat types near the pond. So having um, hedges, having trees, having grassland, you're then kind of opening up to different wildlife accessing that pond. Um, I talked a bit about lining and filling. Filling with, um, with uh, rainwater is definitely beneficial if you can. Um, I know sometimes that's not always possible when you're creating a new pond, um, but placing water butts nearby, if you happen to have a, a shed or a building near your pond and, and, and having a water butt nearby for topping it up will just save you from get those algal blooms um, by um, not having to add in the, the nutrients from the tap water. So that's really helpful. And the example here has got a butyl liner. Um, I have seen kind of, you can get fixed shape ones um, that are a bit sturdier, but more expensive. Um, and as I said, you could just use the washing up bond as well. So you could reuse an old something because that's great to demonstrate um, repurposing um, things that would go to landfill. Um, one thing that we didn't mention there was depth. Having a varying depth is really great for wildlife. Um, I'll show you on this slide here. So having um, a, a deep space as well as a shallow space, um, again, just provides different niches for different wildlife. Um, and having a mix of native planting um, really helps. If you've got plants that um, we call marginal, where they stick up out of the water, that provides um, uh, stems for things like dragonfly larvae to crawl up um, and, and emerge from the pond. Um, other species will lay their eggs in emerging plants. And you also want some submerged plants, particularly our oxygenators um, under the surface, providing uh, that service of oxygenating the water for us. Uh, yeah, and it doesn't have to be particularly deep. The deep bit, you know, 60 centimeters is, is fine for a deep space, um, particularly if it's not in complete full sun, it's not likely to dry out if you've got a deep space, a deep bit of 60 centimeters. Um, it doesn't have to be really, really deep. And uh, I've got a slide here with a couple of a couple of examples of, of planting, really. So the middle picture is water mint, um, really great sensory plant, smells really lovely. Um, and it emerges out of the pond. So great for our damselfly. I think there is a tight, if you look really closely, there is a damselfly on the water mint. And then on the uh, right, we've got purple loose strife, um, which is great for pollinators. It's native. Um, and again, it, it likes it likes its feet wet. So it might grow adjacent to ponds in soil, but it might also grow on those margins of the pond. Um, so it provides that shelter as well as um, uh, nectar source for pollinators. I've also put in a picture on the left of a wildlife pond with, uh, hopefully tries to demonstrate that mix of habitats around the pond. So you've got some larger um, canopy trees nearby for birds. We've got some shrubby spaces, there's grassland. I think it's got a little pebble beach as well for reptiles and amphibians to sunbathe on, nice big rocks um, for, for hibernating underneath. Um, so hopefully that kind of gives you an idea of, of what we're trying to achieve with these kind of um, uh, mosaic-y type habitats where it's not just all uniform, it's got little patches of different niches so that different species will flourish and make it really rich in biodiversity. Um, and this is one of the wildlife watch sheets that I mentioned earlier um, that shows you how to make a little tiny mini pond. So this is a really nice one for a nice little project for an after school club or an eco club um, or a brownie or guides unit, for example. Really nice, easily to, easy to do. Um, the key with these little mini um, mini ponds is to make sure you've got that access right because if there's no ramp or, or logs or, or, or stones coming out stuff might not be able to get back out again and you might end up with some sad casualties um, so make sure there's access in and out of those little mini ponds but you can plant plants in there 
Um, and you'll be amazed how quickly things colonize these new ponds. Um, lots of ponds I've been involved in, uh, in creating, um, we've been surprised that even like the, the next spring there's been frog spawn in it. So if you build it, the wildlife will come. And there's some lovely pictures. There we go. <laughs> so some um, lots of lovely frog spawn on the on the left. Um, we've got some damselflies in the middle laying their eggs into the pond, um, and um, a, a newt newt. I can't remember what we call a newtlet or newt nymph or something like that. Um, you can see his gills still on the side of his head. Um, so yeah, amazing um, up close nature connection that's possible with doing our kind of pond dipping activities with our with our students. I was told not to put frog spawn in ponds with newts because the newts eat the frog spawn. Yeah, you tend to get one or the other in your ponds. Um, the newts are hungry. Newt, the newts in ponds will eat most of what's in your pond. Um, so yeah, in my experience, you either get one or the other. You either have a froggy pond or a newty pond. Um, but what you definitely don't want to put in your wildlife ponds, we didn't mention it earlier, is fish. Um, because they will eat everything. So you don't really want fish in a wildlife pond. Right, um, native hedgerows. So um, again, many of your schools and settings probably already have hedgerows, um, but I'm sure some of them could do with a little bit of love um, and a bit of restoration. Um, normally, whenever I go around school grounds and I, I have a look at hedgerows, I can normally see um, areas that could be improved with filling in the gaps um, or replacing some species with more native species. And there's loads of great tree packs available um, from different charities. Woodland Trust um, normally do one every winter where you can apply as a school for free for a free pack of um, tree whips. And they're just, they just look like dead sticks. Um, they send you this big pack and you plant them directly into the ground. Um, and the way I normally uh, recommend is doing it like a zigzag pattern so that you have a depth to your hedge. So if you just plant them in a row, it just looks a bit weird um, when they start growing because it's just a, a line of trees um, and there, there isn't the depth for wildlife to shelter properly. So if you're doing it in a zigzag pattern or filling in gaps using a zigzag pattern, um, you'll create a better shelter space. And hedges are great. If you've got a problem with um, exposure in your outdoor learning spaces, if it's too windy, put in a hedgerow. <laughs> um, if, uh, if you've got a problem with noise, put in a hedgerow, loads and loads of solutions. It's, it's kind of the solution to many of the problems with teaching outside is, is carefully planned and um, well-sighted hedgerows. Um, if you uh, make sure you plant native stuff um, and then that will have a greater benefit to wildlife um, through the, um, if you're getting packs through from Woodland Trust and, uh, and other charities like that, they'll definitely make sure you are getting native species, but just double check what you're putting into the ground. Um, the reason why we advocate native over non-native and ornamental species is that um, they support a greater biodiversity of creatures. Um, if you plant an ornamental tree, um, it may look very pretty, um, but it possibly isn't as beneficial to wildlife and, and hence um, that kind of the greater picture of a nature recovery network than if you planted a hazel, for example. Um, and there's also lots of great species that provide loads of resource that you could maybe use in your school. So if you planted willow, if you planted hazel, for example, you can coppice those, pro those products um, and use them for art things. So willow, you can do loads of great weaving projects with willow. You can use it in um, topics if you're thinking about um, um, a lot of Neolithic topics, for example, you could do, um, uh, you could make little fences and stuff and think about Stone Age technology. Um, hazel, again, you can think about um, the, the charcoal industry and, and how that impacted our landscape in southern England and think about coppice rotations. Um, so there's loads of kind of cross curricular topics that you can do and, and then have that great resource for doing craft projects with. Um, when you're planting your trees, I've just written another note here to remind myself to just say, um, think about um, um, looking after those whips when they're in the ground. 
Um, you can get tree protectors, but then you need to remember to take the tree protector off. Um, otherwise you start inhibiting growth or even worse, they degrade and you end up with plastic litter everywhere. So think about protecting your tree saplings. Um, don't put them in, for example, again, don't put them in places where you know there's going to be heavy footfall because they'll just get trampled and, and squished. So you might have to put some like dead hedging brash, for example, to protect those saplings whilst they're taking, taking, into, taking in. But they will start growing um, if you're planting them directly into the soil in the winter. Um, they should take, hopefully most of them will take and, and start looking quite shrubby within a couple of years. Um, so uh, we always say the best time to plant a tree was 30 years ago, but the next best time to plant a tree is today. So although it might be a long term project, putting in hedgerows or building a woodland in your school site, um, it's still worth starting, um, even if you might not be there to see the results or your children will have grown and it will be the uh, our future generation of children who will benefit from those trees being on that site. So um, don't let that put you off that you're not going to get immediate results, but you will get nice shrubby, shrubby hedges fairly, uh, fairly quickly within a year or two. Um, yeah, that one's a bit obvious. So the benefits of he hedgerows is that you, um, your hedgerows will provide nectar and food sources for lots of our lovely uh, wildlife, particularly our urban wildlife will come and nibble on all of these things. Um, with regards to tree planting and hedgerow planting, I was also going to mention actually that they make really great events for involving parents. So if you wanted to um, organise a work party day, for example, um, it, it does draw people in. They are excited to plant trees. So um, that would be a good first step to recruiting lots of lovely parent volunteers to help with grain, grounds maintenance, um, get them digging in some trees for you. And here's some of the creatures that might benefit from that new habitat. So we've got lots of um, different species here that we see both in urban and rural spaces. Um, so there's a huge variety here from different, different types of um, thrush. You've got uh, blackbirds there, song thrush. We've got goldfinches, nuthatches, tits, loads of stuff, robins, pigeons, all of that is very, um, very easy to spot. Um, on your spaces and um, there's loads of great citizen science projects that you could get involved in with help with the children to help them connect and notice this wildlife on their space so the, the big garden bird watch for example is um, an rspb event that they do annually so that's a great one to start with to start recording what birds you're spotting in your school grounds and similarly with invertebrates um, I've got some pictures here. I've got a stag beetle up in the top corner here. We've got some ladybirds. We've got snails. We've got hoverflies. Mimic, mimic. That's a mimic hoverfly, I think, in the middle. Um, hummingbird, moths, um, red admirals, uh, chasers, bumblebees, crickets, and damselflies. So there's loads of diversity. Those are things that you'll find even in urban schools. You'll, you'll find bits and pieces like this. And other projects that you could do, citizen science things you could do. There's the great stag beetle hunt with the PTES um, website. So that's recording stag beetle uh, findings. Uh, Southampton um, and the New Forest are a hotspot for stag beetles. So they are quite rare nationally, um, but we do seem to be in a bit of a hotspot for them. So we find them fa fairly regularly, um, particularly if you have dead wood on your site, because the larvae live in the dead wood for about six or seven years before emerging as the adult at night to go and, and mate. So that's a great one. If you find the larvae, you can record it as well. Um, and there's other ones. There's the big butterfly count in the summer and the Bumblebee Conservation Trust also do surveys on their website too. Okay, I'm gonna talk next about wildflower meadows. Um, this is some one of the frequent asks I get is uh, from schools to advise about wildflower meadows. Um, and um, yeah, it's, uh, I think a lot of people kind of envisage it, envisage it being um, a fairly straightforward, easy process to suddenly have a lovely wildflower meadow. But in reality, actually, it takes a lot of work. It's quite labor intensive to start with. And you do need to um, plan and think ahead of what you're doing um, to be successful. So, um, 
think about what you'd like to do and then maybe um, start doing a bit of background um, reading around wildflower meadows and maintenance. Um, what might be more achievable is small strips um, or designated spaces that you turn into a wildflower meadow or a space. So I've got a picture up here. I know this isn't a school grounds, but it's a small space of, um, it's a small courtyard space, which a lot of schools will have little areas like this within them that, um, again, this is, it would be quite achievable to turn into a wildflower strip. So, um, there's a few things to, to think about before you plan it in. Um, what I would suggest, first of all, is to leave it a summer um, uncut and survey what's already growing in that space. So if you, um, um, there's lots of great, um, what's it called? The FSC guides are a great point um, for IDing, they're really great. There's a, there's a school grounds one in particular I'm thinking of, which can help you ID some of the things you might already have in your grassland. So leave the space that you are thinking uncut, survey what's there, At, uh, assess what soil type you have, what the aspect of that space is. Is it in full sun? Is it shaded part of the day? Um, how big is the space? And then you've got a couple of things, a couple of routes really that you could go down. So there's, if you've got some stuff already in there and it's quite diverse, um, you might wanna think about going down the plug planting route. Um, and this is a nice thing you can do with the children again, being involved. They can um, dig plug plants like little mini um, wildflowers directly. And again, native is what we would recommend. Dig them directly into um, pockets that you dig up. If you dig up pockets of turf, put the wildflowers in and try and give them as much space as possible so that they don't get out competed by the grass straight away. Um, so plug plants might work and might be a good um, cost effective first step. If that's not going to work, if, it's, if it is actually not particularly diverse um, and um, that's not going to work in your space, you could think about removing um, areas of the turf and directly seeding onto the soil. Um, so you might do that in patches um, or you might completely remove the topsoil of the space you'd like to be a wild meadow and seed directly onto the soil. Um, we call this um, uh, overseeding and you, what you would do is, is kind of really rake the ground so that you um, limit the amount of nutrients because what wildflowers like is nutrient poor soil and um, when we cut grass essentially what we're doing when grass is cut and the cuttings are on the ground, you're feeding the nutrients back into the soil. So if you can cut really, really um, close to the ground, um, rake it, rake it all up. We call it scarifying. If you kind of make bare earth patches when you're raking and then sow the seed into those bare earth spaces, that can be successful in, um, in, in starting up a, a wildflower meadow. Um, and also if you include within that seed mix yellow rattle, yellow rattle is a really clever wildflower. It's lovely as on its own. It's, it's, a, it's actually a really lovely wildflower, but it's also semi-parasitic with grass. So what it does is suppresses grasses growth, um, which then benefits other wildflower seeds and species that you're planting at the same time. Um, so obviously this method is rather labor intensive. Um, what we would recommend as a, a, a kind of a step-by-step -step process is that first year that you're sowing seed, that you um, mow it quite regularly and take up all of those cuttings, um, remove every kind of six to eight weeks, um, take out any um, plants that you don't want in there that might take over, um, such as docks or thistles. Um, and then that next year, um, you'll do the same process again. So you'll be scarifying the ground, laying more seed, and then start establishing a mowing regime that suits what you've planted. So the seed mix that you've planted. If you've planted a mix that will flower early summer, then what you would do is cut after it's, um, after, the, after the flowers have passed and they've set their seed, and then you wouldn't mow again for the rest of the year. Or if you were looking for summer flowering um, meadow, with the mix that you've planted, you would then um, not mow it up. From June onwards, you wouldn't mow it. Um, and then you would mow it after the flowers in the autumn. 
Um, and what we want to do really is, is with this kind of once a year or twice a year mowing regime is um, reduce the competition of, of the grasses with the wildflowers and remove the nutrients. But we also want um, the seed to drop and, and basically kind of fuel it for the next year. So what we sometimes say is leave the hay on the ground for a few days and then rake it up so that it's had a chance to drop all the seeds. So as you can see, it does require a bit of um, maintenance and thought, and it's not particularly straightforward. Um, other things I've seen that have worked really well are containers of wildflowers, so doing smaller pots or containers um, where you can um, um, just sow the seeds directly into soil, grow your wildflowers, and then start again the next year. So that's quite achievable, and we'll have similar um, a similar result if you've got large enough containers, um, providing that nectar source for for bees and, and butterflies. Um, and what I've listed here are some great um, plants that um, will provide those things for bees. So um, we can, we split these out by um, when they flower, because actually there's benefits to having a mix of things in your space. So if all of your um, planting um, flowers early, then actually you've not got any nectar sources later in the year for species to benefit from. But if you've got a nice mix of things that are early, mid and late, then you're providing kind of year round food source for bees. Um, and some of these ones um, sound like weeds, um, but actually um, things like the humble dandelion, for example, support a huge array of wildlife from brimstone butterflies, orange tip butterflies in the early spring, solitary bees, bumblebees. It's an early nectar source for some of our bumblebees that have come out of hibernation. And then later in the year when, um, when they set their seeds, birds such as goldfinches will feed on those seeds. So I know a lot of people will consider them weeds and take them out of their gardens, but actually they are brilliant for wildlife. Uh, but there's lots of pretty stuff as well. If, you, if you're um, needing to make your containers and things look pretty at school for visitors, then there's plenty of lovely herbs um, that will look the part, um, but also provide those services for wildlife. Um, uh, what was I going to say? I was going to say something else then. Um, oh, yeah. The trick with wildlife gardening, if you're going to do pots and containers or having wildflower spaces, um, fruit trees and things like that, for example, in your in your in your grounds is to not be too tidy a gardener. So try and leave things um, for as long as possible before tidying them up. Things like leaving the seed heads on flowers, um, leaving stems that are hollowing out over winter because they provide space for ladybirds to hibernate, for example, leaving mown grass piles to decompose down a little bit because again, they provide a great habitat for things like grass snakes to lay their eggs in or hedgehogs having leaf and leaf piles in the autumn for hedgehogs to create their own hibernation spaces. So try and be as untidy a gardener as possible, which I know sometimes is a bit of a conflict when you've got um, members of your school community who'd like things to look clean and tidy. Um, gonna speed up a little bit because I'm aware of the time going past. Um, so when we're sorting out and thinking about what, what plants we're gonna grow on our green spaces and our, our school grounds. Um, think about all the stages of life cycles and how we can support um, species throughout their whole life cycle, rather than just think about the adult butterfly, for example. Um, so some species um, are great for planting in our grounds because they can do that kind of whole life cycle support. Um, the holly blue caterpillar, for example, will feed on ivy and holly, as the name suggests, um, and the adults will feed on um, lots of the herbs and things that we just talked about that might be in your, your planters and pots. So making sure you've got ivy on your site will support the whole life cycle of the holly blue. Um, we could say the same thing about orange tip butterflies. If you have plants such as, um, this is garlic mustard, this plant that we have in the middle here, the caterpillars love this plant. It's also actually an edible herb for humans. Um, and uh, the, adult butterf uh, the adult butterfly loves dandelions. So if you've got dandelions growing in your, uh, in your school field then and, and some areas in shrubs and, and, and under trees of, of um, garlic mustard, then again, you've, you've covered that whole life cycle's needs for the orange tip butterfly. Um, 
Ivy, if you've got Ivy on your site, I can't um, rave enough about Ivy because it's great for loads of different species and it provides nectar really late into the winter. Um, so particularly for bees and, and other species that might be hibernating over winter, having some Ivy flowering um, on your sites is providing that kind of last bit of, um, of, of nectar ready before they hibernate. So Ivy's great. It also provides shelter for things like bats. If it's on trees, they might um, roost and hibernate under, under ivy. Um, hoverflies, um, hornets I've seen hunting around ivy. So loads and loads of great um, wildlife benefits to having ivy on your site. Um, and I'm then I'll just, I think I've got a few slides in a row now of just some species that grow at different um, in different terms. So um, think about, when you're planting um, what you're going to see during the terms that children are going to be on site so here's a few examples of things that will flower in the early spring so we've got some lovely um lovely herbs here the garlic mustard i just mentioned is an early spring plant cookie flower honesty forget me not bugle for example and birds what trefoil is great wildflower um particularly likes acid soil so i've got a lot of it in my front garden actually um because it really likes the soil in the new forest um, and some summer things um, that, again, these look, these all would look lovely in pots and containers, as well as having um, borders and things like that in your school grounds. Honeysuckle is a great one because that um, is uh, something that attracts moths in the evening. The, the scent in the evening attracts the moths and, and the moths attract the bats. And so having some honeysuckle on your site provides those kind of nocturnal creatures with, um, with food sources. And then autumn term, um, teasels are brilliant. I love teasels. I think they're, they're really pretty as they are. Um, I've made things with them with children, such as um, hedgehogs and stuff. Um, and if you observe, if, you're, if you make a little bird hide in your space near your teasels, you may be lucky to see finches coming and feeding on those seed heads. Um, other things like echinacea are lovely in pots and borders. Verbena, there's another picture there of verbena. Um, Buddleia is great. I know, again, a lot of people think of Buddleia as, as, a, as a weed, but actually it's a, a really versatile and interesting um, species that's naturalised now because it's been here so long in this country, it's kind of naturalised. And it does provide a lot of um, species of butterfly with, with nectar. Um, in fact, I think a lot of people call it the butterfly bush. Um, and it's really interesting if you cut it, at the time of year that you'd like it to flower next year, it will flower at that time of year. So if you want it to be an autumn flowering thing, cut it after the autumn and then it should flower again for the autumn. And then winter, um, lots of um, shrubs that we can plant, particularly in our hedgerows with interesting berries can provide food sources for things like um, thrushes, um, red wings, etc. And also look really pretty and we can do lots of um, arts and poetry and, and other kind of cross curricular stuff looking at those um, um, colours and, and, and seasonal changes that we can observe in our spaces. I'm trying to speed up a little bit because I'm aware everyone's worked a long day. Um, this is another of our ID charts from the Wildlife Watch website, a nice accessible one for children. There's plenty of these that you can download for free and laminate so that you have them in your outdoor learning packs. Um, I, think they're, I think they're brilliant um, and really accessible. So do take a look at those. Um, and then a couple of other ideas of things that you can think about on your spaces. Um, so log piles. Um, we talked about having some dead wood near ponds. But having um, log piles just dotted around in different spaces just provide those um, other species on your site with shelter. Um, they might also get used by um, children for den building and other kind of creative and, and, and teamwork type activities. So uh, as much deadwood as you can put on site, the better. Um, and if you do have um, fruit trees on your site, um, think about leaving out um, rotten apples, for example, because you'll have things like um, blackbirds and red wings come and feast on those rotten apples. So don't just compost and get rid. Do you think about providing food for wildlife? Um, maybe set up a wildlife camera and film what comes to eat your apples um, after the children have gone. Um, that's really engaging for children to see what's visiting their site out of school hours. 
And if you're in a particularly um, built up school, think about other features that you could build, making most of some of the built spaces. So window boxes are a great idea for herbs and pollinating plants. Some of the bug hotel things I've seen are really innovative, making the most of sort of the built environment and, and recycled materials. Um, I've also um, seen a great examples of um, um, people just drilling holes in, in stuff. So if you've got a fence that's a bit old and whoever manages it doesn't mind getting the drill out and just drilling holes into existing wood, um, that will provide really great um, spaces for solitary bees. So just drill holes and stuff, really easy. <laughs> and pro providing lots of habitat space. There we go, there's lots of drilled holes for you. <laughs> And then a few pictures of what you might find in your log piles and bug hotels. So we've got a cardinal beetle, the red one, and cockchafer. They like it um, underground. They emerge, um, called, often called May bugs, because they often come um, emerge from their larval stage in, in May. Some other examples of how you could be creative with your log piles. So you could turn them into fencing or borders. They could be more aesthetically um, laid out so that it looks like an interesting feature you could help use them to help change um, your topography so that you've got changes of, of, um, of topography on your space because often school grounds tend to be very flat and not very interesting whereas topography actually does um, make spaces more engaging um, you might have old tree stumps um, or trees taken out if you could ask for the stump to be returned and you can turn the stump upside down and that makes a great um, mini beast um, home too or you can partially bury stuff, um, like I said, for the stag beetles, for example, they love um, buried dead wood. Uh, another example of one of the watch sheets on making hidey holes. So you can have a look at, uh, download that and have a look at that. Uh, a couple of pictures of bat and bird boxes. Um, like I said, with bird boxes, you do need to think about cleaning them out. Um, the one, the picture on the left is a bat box. Um, uh, which um, you could put up high on the top of buildings or put them on trees. Um, what bats like, if you're able to, is having a couple of bat boxes on different sides of the tree, because sometimes um, they'll climb out during the day and move around to a different box that's warmer as the sun moves. So if you're able to have them kind of going around a tree, then um, that works well for bats. Um, and then different cool. types Sorry. of feeder. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Can I just ask, do, with the bat um, boxes, do you, do they need to be cleaned out, or are they? No, no, they don't. No, they don't need cleaning out. Um, they they're essentially like a long drop anyway. So um, they kind of they scramble up. It's a vertical box, so there's no um, there's no base if that makes sense for things to build up. Um, so what you will, you probably will want to cite them so that they're not kind of dropping all their droppings directly onto the classroom window, for example. Um, but there's nothing to clean out because it's just a, a long drop, essentially. Having them in, I would say having them in, if you've got woodland on your site or trees, mature trees, that would be the best place, really. Um, yeah. <laughs> Does that make sense if I explain that? So there's no kind of bottom bit like a bird box that you clean out. Um, different types of feeder, um, you, there's loads on the market, so you can get different things that will um, enable different species to access the food. So if you just have one type of feeder and one type of food, you're just feeding a, a particular um, type of species. So having a mix is really good on your sites um, and involving the children in refilling these, cleaning them out, restocking, um, again, is just deepening that nature connection and helping them feel that they're taking action for nature because um, it's very overwhelming, the nature crisis and climate change and um, eco-anxiety is a, a, a big issue for our young people. Um, there was a global survey recently that, I can't remember the exact stati uh, statistic, but it was sort of 60% of young people um, feel impacted on in their day-to-day -day life by um, the anxiety that climate change and nature um, crisis is having on their lives. So giving them routes where they're able to make direct action and change and benefit um, is, is a great way to support children that may be feeling that anxiety. Um, yeah, more bird feeders. <laughs> and composting, 
Um, making space in your school grounds for compost heaps is really great. There's lots of different types that you can put in place. You can make those kind of square pallet ones where you rotate, use one for a bit, um, cover it, cover a full one, let it, um, let it um, heat up and decompose, and then you can remove the compost and start refilling a different one on a rotation. Um, there's these Dalek ones, which um, are, are useful too, particularly if you have kind of rats on site, that's a useful type of compost bin to use um, to reduce that problem. And wormeries are really great too, um, particularly if you have um, an outdoor classroom or a forest school space and the children will be bringing out snacks, fruit snacks regularly, and you have all of these snack leftovers, having a wormery right there in your forest school for the snack leftovers to go in um, is really great. And um, plus the benefit of the children get to like open the lid and have a look at all the worms and pick the worms up and stuff. So that's something to think about. Um, they're relatively cheap. Um, you can find lots of different, different companies selling them online. And having composting spaces or compost on site um, will benefit reptiles and um, amphibians. There's a nice picture here of a lovely slow worm. They love a compost heap. Um, they're beautiful creatures um, that uh, are really exciting for children to find. So that's, I'd say, having a compost heap just in case you have slow worms one day when you open the lid is worth it. <laughs> and then some other ideas of things to do if you've got a, a very built up space, um, green roofs, you could put, uh, if you have sheds or any outbuildings at your school, you could maybe um, make uh, those green roofs um, so that you can just add a bit more greenery to your site. You could put herbs up there, sedums I've seen are quite useful. Um, uh, and then I've also mentioned water butts. Um, I would definitely recommend putting some water butts in on your site. And something else you might want to think told, about. Sorry, yeah. Sorry, I've been told that we can't use water butts because of the stagnant water. It depends what you're using the water for, but I would go with what the local authority advise you. Um, if you've got one that is just going to be feeding your wildlife pond and not used by the children for play, um, that you might be able to risk assess that and get that passed. Um, yeah, I, I would go with what your local authority advise. Um, okay, thank things you. like plant watering and, and ponds, um, I would recommend having a water butt for those activities. And then you might want to bring fresh, clean water for, for children's activities that they're going to be doing that's going to be involving like mud play or kitchens or um, where they're going to be getting their hands wet, essentially. You might want to use fresh water for that. Um, but take advice from, yeah, I would take advice from the local authority on that. Thank you. But thanks for raising that, that's a good point. Um, I would also, um, if you have a school that's very exposed, um, have a think about drought resistant planting, um, or if you know that you're going to struggle over summer with um, volunteer waterers, um, planning out your planting regime so that it requires the minimum amount of watering um, saves you a bit of um, coming in over the summer holidays to water stuff. So that's worth investigating and looking into as well. And then just to finish off, I just wanted to show you a couple of before and after pictures. So this is the before picture of that strip of wildflowers that I showed you earlier. Um, so they took up all of the um, paving slabs and then laid their seed directly. Um, they also built some planters along where they had um, a sunny aspect um, and, a, and a wall for things to grow up. So they've got some sweet peas growing in those planters and other um, herbs and, and butterfly plants. They had a water butt installed. Um, and then as you can see, look, they've got the bare, bare soil there um, and then they planted it with seeds and that was the summer. Um, and and the, the, the impact quite, um, was was quite lovely but um something just to bear in mind when you're when you're creating these wildflower meadows is that um things like poppies are annuals so if you want poppies you will have to reseed them every year um whereas a lot of the other plants if you're if you've got a perennial mix that means that um they'll come up year on year so um although they've got a few poppies i can see in there this first year that might look very different next year um unless it's reseeded but I think this gives a good kind of inspiration on what you can do in a really small little built up space. Um, and there's loads of stuff here. I can see Budlia in the corner. They've got sunflowers in pots. They've got herbs. 
and then all of that nectar rich and, and, and exciting wildflower in the, mid, in the middle. So I think that's quite inspiring what you can do in, in one year in a very small built up space. And here's some of the wildlife that they had that first year, some lovely mint moths and mimic, uh, I think that's a, a little solitary wasp and all sorts. Oh, yeah, so loads you can do. Um, hopefully we've given you some good ideas and, and some inspiration, but I think really the, that process of making sure you're doing your surveying, your planning, your consultation with um, the school community, um, thinking about involving local organisations like other charities to help you with training, advice, impact assessment, etc. before you start making any change. And then um, recruiting as many volunteers, parent helpers, community to help with creating those wilder spaces with that vision of connecting into a nature network with other green um, spaces in your community. Um, I think thinking of it as a whole process rather than I'm just going to build a wildlife eco garden will make it a much more sustainable and more impactful um, bit of work. So hopefully that's helped with some of those kind of ideas about becoming wilder. And just to end, I'm going to quickly um, go through some slides that the South Downs um, Education Network have sent me. Um, so this training session was part of a wider programme that they're delivering. Um, so um, our organisation, the Wildlife Trust, is a member of this network. Um, it's, a, it's a collective of over 100 education sites, centres and practitioners based in and around the South Downs National Park. Um, in Hampshire, we're so lucky to have two wonderful national parks, both uh, kind of in our county and on our doorsteps. Um, and their, their aims are to deliver activities for schools and other groups, but also to help them better understand the special uh, qualities of, of these protected landscapes. So here's a list of things that um, they offer. Um, so they can provide setting or context for locally relevant curriculum for your school. Um, members of the education network um, offer a range of trips, outreach sessions where they can come to your school and teach groups, online lessons, downloadable teaching resources, all sorts. Their website is excellent. I do recommend having a look um, and do consider getting in touch with them um, as part of your planning um, to, so that they can let you know what support is available if you're within or on the border of, of the South Downs National Park. Um, and they appreciate that um, for most teachers, for most schools, trips into the National Park are not gonna be taking place on a weekly basis, um, but by taking part in, in the training today, hopefully um, you're helping to build learning outside the classroom into your school's curriculum. And really, I think that's where the biggest, um, you know, the, the, all, all, of our, all of the members working together, that's what we all want is more children accessing their local nature um, so um, building learning outside the classroom in your school's curriculum um, and affording those associated benefits to pupils and staff really is kind of all of our our key aim um, the South Downs National Park Network also believe that understanding more about the national park from nature to recreation to jobs is an important part of young people's development um, as they will be part of the landscape, not just while they're in school, but for the rest of their lives, because we're all connected to where we grew up. Um, so I definitely agree with what they say there. Um, so here's where to go for more information. That's their, um, their website and the email address there for the education officers. Um, and then uh, our Hampshire one down here, the Hampshire Outdoor Education Team e email address is the one you're going to want down here in their telephone number if you need to access any other support and information. So maybe that question about water butts might be well pointed in their direction, actually, see what they say. Um, where did I get to on their list of stuff I'm supposed to tell you about to make sure I cover all the important stuff? Um, yes, yeah, so it's also worth checking with your local outdoor education advisor. So that's, that's the email address at the bottom there. Um, and they'll give you information about um, kind of health and safety considerations and compliance. Um, and then finally, um, if today's session inspires you to discover more about the South Downs and national parks in general, so we, as I said, we're so lucky to have two in our patch, the New Forest as well, it might be worth investigating the learning resources on um, the nationalparks.uk website. Um, and this includes a scheme of work consisting of 11 inquiries tracing the history of Britain's national parks. So that's really 
I think that's a great resource that you could tap into and, and, and can work into some of your planning. Um, seven inquiries focus on how different national parks are managing their precious environments for the future in a sustainable way. And this includes finding ways to accommodate increasing numbers of visitors, um, overseeing biodiversity enhancement schemes, implementing flood control measures and balancing the needs of economic development with those of environmental conservation. Um, and going back to what I said about eco-anxiety, I think these kind of topics, actually, if we can weave these kinds of um, learning ele elements into our curriculum, we're hopefully giving children the tools and knowledge to be able to take positive action and to not feel overwhelmed and, and increasing anxiety about, um, about the future. So I, I would definitely um, look into that and see what, what works with your schemes of work. Um, the scheme um, with its wealth of resources, detailed background notes, engaging learning and teaching ideas and assessment um, has been written by specialists um, for teachers at Key Stage 2 and 3. Um, and the inquiry, inquiries will find a natural home in geography, but each also has a strong cross-curricular link to English and maths and other foundation subjects. Um, and each is designed to enable pupils not only to build knowledge, but also to master and apply a wide range of geographical skills um, to ensure that they understand the significance of what they've learned. So yeah, do have a look into that. Um, and hopefully that is really helpful. Um, how am I doing for time? I feel like I've run over. I'm so sorry if I have. Oh no, I'm just about in time. Thank you all so much for bearing with me with my technical difficulties. I don't know what happened there. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing for a moment. Um, I'm going to put my email address in the chat. Um, if anybody would like more information about the, the, the help that we can offer schools, um, We've also got um, a really great website um, which gives information about Team Wilder and um, school champions. If you're interested in signing up as a school champion, um, as um, create, uh, becoming a Wilder school, um, Craig, my colleague Craig will be able to help you with all of that and um, support you along that journey. Um, and it's hopefully going to build and build. So we're in year, year one of our Team Wilder strategy. So you, if you're joining now, you're joining right at the start of this movement. And it's going to keep going for 10 years and should hopefully grow into a really strong movement of good practice, of sharing knowledge, skills um, and, and just benefiting our children and young people at the end of the day.